This is a very important teaching. You may hear some things, not trying to be smart saying this, you may hear some things you never heard in your life before. That's how critical this is. So listen, be wise, keep your mind glued on this, and don't let it wander all over the place. Look at your notes, and here we go. Kadosh Yisrael. Here is another wonderful name of God. It means the Holy One of Israel. It is pronounced like Kadosh, K-A-W, though it's not spelt that way. It's spelt Q-E-D-O-S-H, like Kedosh, but it's Kadosh, K-A-W hyphen D-O-S-H, Yis, or like Y-I-S-R-A-E-L, or A-I-L, Yisrael. This particular name takes quite a bit of study and digging in the scriptures. In many ways, it is not what people have been told. It is something different and wonderful. Here is our first scriptural reading. It's Leviticus 19, verses 1 and 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Leviticus 19, as I've said, verses 1 and 2. Look this way. We learn more of this from the notes momentarily. Holiness is not in its purest form and there's a lot to say about this this morning. It is not something that you do. Holiness is not about performance. It is about commitment. God said that the children of Israel were not only holy unto him, he said they were his treasure. When at the same time they were proving they were rebellious. And he was having to deal with them strongly to get them in the line. And yet he went ahead and called them a holy people, his treasure. What is it to be holy? To be holy is to be holy his. To be God's. Even though you're far from perfect, and may take a long time to get into line with what he wants to teach you, and that will happen through growth as you go on with God, and you'll never be fully perfect within yourself until one day we're in heaven, we see him face to face. We'll never be as perfect ever as he is, obviously, but we grow. There's a difference between being born and then growing and developing. A child gets born, and it doesn't wait for six months until then it grows an extra arm. It doesn't have to wait for three years before it grows a left ear. When it is born, it is complete. It's alive. It's a human being. But of course, it's not mature. It has to develop. We have to develop. We have to grow. But when you get saved, and you become his, you're holy. You're holy unto the Lord. Well, I didn't know I was holy. Well, you know it today. God calls you holy because what is holy is the person that belongs to him, not the person who is perfect. Now, this is very scriptural, and we'll see to it in a moment or two. But get that into your mind. What happens is this. We become holy before the Lord, and then we learn and we grow in Christ. And more and more we will conform unto his will. 
but he accepts us because we're holy. That is, we have been born again and given unto him. And as his child, we are accounted holy because we've committed our lives unto him, period. Amen. So that we don't worry all the time that we're not holy enough and we're always condemned by the devil, and we always have to do do this and do do that to be holy. No, you're already holy, and you're already accepted before the Lord, but you may still be a baby, and you have to grow. When a baby is born, he is a baby all right. He belongs to that mother and father all right, but he has a lot to learn, hasn't he? And do you think because he can't walk immediately and he can't talk immediately and he's not mature immediately and he gets all mixed up immediately and he cries when he shouldn't cry and he stays up half the night that suddenly they say that he doesn't belong to them? He's theirs 100%. There's no doubt about it. He belongs to them. He's totally accepted. But what he needs is to mature and develop and that takes time. But there's not going to be a question as to who belongs to who because he belongs to them because he was born into their family. The greatest weapon that the devil has for the believer is condemnation that they're not good enough, that they're always failing, that they're not doing enough. And the devil not only jumps on that condemnation, he has preachers all over the world who assist him every week. Amen. They really, really know how to assist the devil, even though many of them don't know they're doing that, but they know what they're doing. And that is they constantly try to tell us, you know, how to be more holy by doing this, that, and the other thing. And they'll quote such things as, you know, uh, without holiness, uh, no man shall see the Lord. Well, the word holy there uh, simply means those that are his. Without being his, you'll never see the Lord. Why we know that? Does our parents, uh, or do our parents, I mean, are they going to disown us because we're five years old and we still don't know everything and we're not perfect? It's just madness. I want us to read that scripture again. And the Lord, is, and this is not an easy message, but it's a glorious message once you get the truth of it. Stop allowing the devil to rob you of the joy of salvation because he contemns you for your failures. Some of them are failures and some of them are not. Some of them is just the devil's accusation. You're human and God knows you're human. You're far from perfect. What God wants is for you to belong to him and to be committed to him. He's not asking you to be perfect. He knows that you will grow and you will develop. But the devil wants it to appear that God's upset with you all the time because you're far from perfect. The devil is a liar. Yeah. We preach grace here. It's the grace of God. And the grace of God is that God saves people. He forgives people. He writes their name on the Lamb's book of life. He calls them his own. They're without condemnation. Why? Because Jesus died on Calvary and they trust that. They're not trusting their own works. They're trusting his work on Calvary and they have become his. And when you're his, because you surrender to him, even with all your failures, you become holy before the Lord. That's a fact, friends. You say, well, I didn't know that. Well, you know it now. And it's going to be deep here today. So hold on to it. I want to read that scripture again. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for thou the Lord your God am holy. Leviticus 19, verses 1 and 2. Holy. God is telling us to be holy because he is holy. This question immediately arises. What is meant by be holy? Now look this way. In Northern Ireland... When I went as a young person to the Holiness Church, when I look back on it, it was hell on earth. It was hell on earth. If you got any way happy at all, you know, and you got there for the Holiness meeting on Thursday nights, it usually only took the pastor 20 minutes to correct your happiness. 
And, and he wanted to know, did you think wrong today? Did you lose your temper today? Did you do this? Did you do that? Poured in all this condemnation that you're not holy. I found after living for a while, he was far from holy himself. <laughs> far from it. But he condemned everybody, and the church does it to this day. Holiness is a gift from God. It's a gift. You're holy. It's settled. Why? Because Jesus died and you trusted, period. Amen. Because Jesus died and you trust what he did for you, period. That makes you holy before God. Say, I'm shocked. Well, you ought to be greatly joyful over the shock. Because the devil can ruin the glorious blessing of Calvary and salvation by making us miserable from morning to night because we're so conscientious of all our failures. God knows that we're human. What he's asking for is our commitment. Amen. We belong to him. He can put up with our immaturity and growth in Christ will help us to do that. But what God's looking for is commitment. God is telling us to be holy because he is holy. The question arises, what is meant by be holy? Most people are raised with a wrong understanding of what it means to be holy. Tradition says that holiness is associated to performance, such as obeying certain laws, dressing in a certain way, being nice to everybody, and generally appear to be what is called a saint to everybody. Look back this way, you know, my goodness. I shouldn't talk about it anymore, but that little man in Ireland, oh, he needed somebody to guzzle him. He just kept everybody, and he was so sincere. Kept everybody, you know, have you lost your temper this week? He never once told us about the glorious victory of Calvary. It was all as if we had to do this, do that, and do the other thing. Wrong. You are declared holy because you're His. Then after that, you will start to grow in the Lord and be conformed to what He wants for you. That takes time. That takes a period. But you will never, now listen to it, you never will get to the point where you're holy because you do things. You're holy because you're committed to Him and He has declared you so. Amen. Period. Here is the shocker, it says. To be holy is not based upon performance. It is based upon our commitment. What a revelation on what an understanding to have. Now look this way. When you're holy, which means holy His, just like a child belongs to those parents, and yet it's all mixed up and it doesn't know very much, and it's only three months old, but it's, but it's, it's theirs. When you're holy, you're his. Now listen to this. Being holy, being his, all because of the blood, will change you. But it takes time. As God throws his light upon the scriptures, you will grow like the child grows. But being changed will never make you holy. Being holy will change you. But because you change, it won't make you holy. Because no matter how much you change, it's not up to your works. It's up to what he did on the cross and your acceptance of that. And once you accept that, God said, like he said to the children of Israel, you are my treasure, you're holy people. He actually said, you're a holy people separated unto me. And there were a bunch of rascals half the time because they were his. He had to deal with them in their lives. It took time and many times they disobeyed them and there's no fun in that either. But holiness or acceptance is because... Jesus died for us, we accept him, and he has declared us holy unto him, and we're covered by the blood. And once you've got that, you'll be able to start to grow in the Lord because you won't be sick all day long by being condemned because it's, happy, it's, it's hard to grow in the Lord when you're always condemned by every little thing. Amen. Amen. Important, it says here, God is not asking you to be totally perfect, which is performance. He is asking you to be totally His, which is commitment. 
Do you know that the Hebrew, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, 14, where it says, follow peace with all men and holiness. That preacher in Ireland, he used that scripture all the time. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. You know what was holy? Look this way. You know what was holy in Belfast? I shall not eat ice cream on a Sunday. Thou shalt not shine your shoes on a Sunday. We had such rules. I told you before one time, that's the way we were raised. And then two preachers came over from America to preach. And Mooring and I were out supposed to entertain them. We were very young people. And doggone it, if the two evangelists didn't say, let's stop, it was a Sunday, and they wanted to buy an ice cream. Boy, I felt tortured. <laughs> I was tormented. And they wanted these uh, cones. And so we stopped and they got these cones. And they, uh, he got it and the other preacher got it. And Maureen got it and I got it. And I didn't want to do. I didn't know what to do. I thought I was going to hell for sure. <laughs> and I thought, seriously, it was awful. Because then I wasn't holy before God. And I thought, well, well, the first thought I had was I'll put it into my pocket. And then I thought I can't put ice cream into my pocket. And I was tortured. And the, the most awful thing was not those two preachers. They never even thought about it. It was Maureen. She is over there enjoying. <laughs> not a solitary conviction about the whole thing altogether. You've got to watch holier than thou people who will rob the joy of your salvation by condemning you because you're human and you fail. Thank God for Calvary, the benefits of which we get because we trust what he did and not because we show how great we are. Go ahead and praise him. Some time ago, no, no, I'll, I'll come to that in a moment because I have a bit more to finish on this. Hebrews 12, 14, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. That is being his. Holiness is being His. It's commitment to Him, not being perfect. And of course, you'll never see the Lord if you're not His. That's obvious, isn't it? Here's some illustrations. If you've got a car, and that car is not going very well. In fact, what it says here is, don't laugh, it's paid for. But it's your car, all right, and you've got it paid for. Does that mean it's perfect? No, it's not perfect, but it's totally paid for. You're not perfect, but you've been totally paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that in many ways, preachers have done more damage to Christians than anybody else in the world with their message of constant condemnation so that we don't have joy because we always feel we fall short. Or it says here in the next little illustration, a house. If you've got a house and you have it paid for, your home is paid for, does that mean everything about it is perfect? No. Or another one there, we already talked about it. If you have children, they're yours totally. Are they perfect? No. Some time ago, I bought a Jewish Bible, which of course only has the Old Testament and uh, their commentary on it. And I want you to see what the Jewish people say is the meaning of something in the Old Testament. It's magnificent. <clears throat> Let me quote to you from the Jewish study Bible. <clears throat> Are you reading this with me? Here is part of their commentary relating to Leviticus 19 verse 2, which I read to you earlier. Now, you've got to get this. Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. That's the scripture. Now, here's what they say. This is the caption. What follows is its elaboration. Later interpreters often took it as a general command to emulate divine attributes such as compassion and forgiveness. You be holy, you know, and you be like God, and you, you have these attributes, Passion and forgiveness. Some interpreters later on said that. But what does the Bible say? And these are people who know Hebrew through and through. These are scholars. But holy in the Bible does not refer... By the way, these are not my words. I'm quoting from these people in the Jewish Bible. 
But holy in the Bible does not refer to superior moral qualities. God's holiness is His essential otherness. His being separate from all that is not divine. Humans are not called upon to be holy in this sense, for the text does not say, as I am holy. Holiness in humans, as in time, space, objects, and speech, is the state of belonging to the deity, being designated God's personal property. That's when you, look, look at me, that's when you are declared holy without condemnation, for there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. That's when you're declared holy when you belong to Him. Not because you're good in your works. And I'm not telling you not to be good. And as you grow in Christ, you'll know how to be better. You'll know whether to eat ice cream or not. That's a development. But none of those things are going to make you holy. What makes you holy is that He saved you and you're now holy His. That's holiness. Let's look at that bottom bit again. Holiness in humans, as in divine space, objects, and speech, is the state of belonging to the deity being designated God's personal property. In the non-priestly tradition, Israel is holy simply by virtue of having been chosen. Leviticus 19, 5 and 6, Deuteronomy 7 and 6, 14, verse 2 and 21. In priestly thought, holiness is the desired result of an effusion of God's imminent presence, according to Exodus 29 and verse 45. Look this way. Look this way. It's like a child being born. He, he, here the mother is pregnant and it's almost birthday. What, 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 what causes it to become a, a living human being when it's born? You don't say, well, it's been living five years and it's learned a lot of things, so now we'll say it's a human being. It's a human being right now as a result of it being born. It's alive. How are you alive in God? Because you were born again in Christ. Your sins are forgiven. You're not condemned. You live under the blood. Go out and be happy without the condemnation of the world, the flesh, and the devil. It says here, the above is a powerful comment from the Jewish Bible. Holiness is not performance. It is commitment. If we are to be holy because God is holy, and if it were based on performance, would that then mean that God has to perform in order for Him to be holy? And in order to maintain His holiness? Obviously not. Look at Deuteronomy 7 verse 6. Here's what God says to the children of Israel who were far from perfect. For thou art an holy people. Hey, wait a minute now. Look, look this way a minute. Were these people really holy? They, 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 they were blowing it all the time. God rebuked them for those things. But God says they're a holy people unto him. Let's read it again. Look at Deuteronomy 7, verse 6. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Look this way. We have got to finally grab hold of the difference between our standing and our state. I've told you about this several times before, but listen to it carefully again. There's your standing before God, and there's your state. What is the difference? Well, our standing before God is we trust Him, we're saved, and we're covered with the blood. Period. What is our state? Well, see, when we're saved and we're His and we're made holy, there is the blood of Christ and the righteousness of Christ put over us. It's, it's, it's absolutely put, put, put over us. D.K. Usene, given to us. So we're under the blood. Therefore, we're covered. And we're accepted holy by God. Underneath Christ's righteousness is our state. And what are we like in our daily state. Well, we're a bit up and down. 
We're doing things we shouldn't be doing. We're struggling. We're trying to make things better. And the devil slips in, and preachers help him, and they say something like this, that your state is so wrong that it means that your standing before God is wrong, and he's condemning you, and you're not really saved. Wrong, 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 wrong. Your standing and your state are do different things. Your state is something that you're growing in. You're making mistakes. You're asking God to help you. You, you trip and fall many a time. You're beginning to grow in the Lord. That's wonderful. You're developing it. But while you're doing that, you're covered with the righteousness of Christ. God looks upon you on His righteousness, and He sees what Christ has done, and He declares you holy unto God because He sees the blood of Christ. There's a difference between the situation which God sees which is your standing before God and your state, which you develop in on a daily basis. The devil will try to make you feel, I repeat, that your standing is wrong because your state is wrong and you're weak there. Well, Lord, I shouldn't have done that. Help me. And you sincerely want to get that corrected. And you sincerely want not to do that next time. And you're struggling, you're battling with it. And, and the devil says, well, well, you know, you're condemned. And then you get so condemned, you know, for weeks you can hardly get right with God because you're dealing with your state and you believe that God is looking on your state wrong. God is looking upon your standing. Your standing is brought about by trusting him. Your state is brought about by learning and growing and maturing. Every day we learn more about it. That is our state. Our standing is through trust, not through performance, through trust. We trust Him, and as we trust Him, we're accepted by the blood, so that even though in our state we're mixed up, we're confused, we're asking for forgiveness, at the same time we rejoice that we're fully accepted by God because of the shed blood and our trust in Him and the standing before God through His imputed righteousness, which is given to us by faith and not by works, even though we have to work on our state and we grow in Christ and we develop in the Lord. Have you got what I just said, friends? Have you got that? That's important big time. I've got to say it again. To so many people, it's the devil, it's the Lord. Let me change it for a moment. It's the Lord condemning everybody because of their state. Therefore, we're human. We're human. We, 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 we make a mess of this and we do that wrong. And, and of course, we're growing and we're not so bad as we used to be in our state. That's growth. And God looks upon us and he, he's always mad with us because of our, our growth or our lack of it. Wrong! God looks upon us and he sees, D.K. Usane, Christ has ministered to us his eternal righteousness. And when God looks upon us, he says that, and he declares that we are holy unto him because we trust him. And then he allows us to develop in him step by step as unto the Lord. Amen. That is very strong and very powerful. Otherwise, you can be miserable most of the time. Let's read again here a little bit. Go back to near the top of page 2. The above is a powerful comment from the Jewish Bible. Holiness is not performance, it is commitment. Look on down a bit to the scripture. Look at Deuteronomy 7, verse 6. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord. And another scripture, by the way, he says, You're my treasure. Were they perfect? Hey, they were far from it. You're holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Look this way. Let's just say underneath in your state that you blew something. You sent you did wrong. Quickly ask God to forgive you and immediately rejoice that you're still accepted before him because of the shed blood and because of his wonderful gift of his righteousness that has been given to you. And don't allow the devil to tell you that your state has canceled your standing. Your state improves as God helps you in growth. 
but the standing before God stays where it is because of your trust. Amen. Lord, I blew it this week, but I thank you that it makes no difference in my relationship with you because I love you and I trust you and I praise you because the devil sometimes so condemns people in their state that they feel that God's condemning them. Therefore, many times they get so discouraged, they quit going to church and they finally backslide. Whereas what we ought to do is ask God to forgive, forgive us in our state, but constantly prove Him and praise Him for His marvelous gift of what? Grace. How are we saved? You're saved by grace. You're saved by grace. It's no other way. You're saved by faith. It's, it's because of the grace of God and the faith that you reached. Oh, I want to get this over strong. But let's look again. The word holy in this verse, and that word is kadosh, is described by Spiros Zodiades as follows. Now get this, friends. This is from the verse, Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, for thou art an holy people. Spiros Zodiades says this, all Israel was holy, a nation separated for God's service. In other words, God had dedicated Israel as his special people. They were considered holy by their relationship to the holy God. Look this way. If you have accepted Christ, if you have said, I belong to him, then God has declared you holy, and that's what he sees. And as you're growing and you're developing and you're learning how some things you stop doing and some things you should be doing because that's growth, you don't allow the devil to condemn you when God is helping you to grow and develop and mature in Christ as if it has something to do with your standing. Your standing stays holy and fully accepted through trust. So you have to learn, even when you feel con condemned, that you don't allow the devil to get the victory there. You may even say, well, yes, I did do something wrong there. God's going to forgive me. I'm going to be matured. However, it's not making any difference toward my acceptance because I'm accepted by him through trust and nothing else. Say, wow. 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 That really is amazing. Here's what we read in Exodus 3, verse 4 and 5. If when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called upon him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Listen to this. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. What is holy? I now quote notes from the Companion Bible relating to the word holy in verse 5 that I just quoted. Here's what it says by this great theologian. Holy, separated or set apart for God, kadosh, holy, must have one identical meaning in all passage, passages and does not imply moral quality. Except, of course, when you're talking about God himself. But when it applies to us, it's nothing to do with moral quality. What does the word holy mean? It means we're consecrated unto God. It means we're dedicated to God. It means we're hallowed to God. It means we're holy unto God because we're his. It means we're a saint. Or we're dedicated like a sanctuary. Look this way. The Roman Catholic Church normally says, if a person's going to be a saint, it's somebody who lives so good, and after about 500 years, we can check up on their lives, and if they've got two or three miracles in their life that can be proved, then after 500 years, why, we can say that they're a saint. A saint totally accepted by God with nothing between that person and God. Now listen to it. A saint, somebody who's totally 
holy before God, and there's absolutely nothing between them and God. Who is a saint? Well, as I say, the Catholic Church says, well, if you do a lot of good things, and then they examine it for about 500 years, then once in a while they can declare you as a saint. Let me tell you what the Bible says. When you get saved, you don't even know too much about the Lord, but you got saved. And you say, I'm yours, and I'm trusting you. At that moment, the Bible says you're a saint. At that moment, you're a saint before God. That is, you are totally and completely without any kind of condemnation whatsoever. You have a happy, thrilling experience with God. Now you then start to grow, and the growing will take time, and there will time you will feel bad that you blew this, you blew that, and you will develop, and you will grow that. That's a good thing. Uh, and, and grow like the child grows until it becomes an adult. But that child is still belonging to his parents. Same with God. When we are saved and we're his, then we are a saint. We're totally accepted. There is no condemnation. We can rejoice in that because we start to think about grace instead of about works. I am sick of listening to people talking about works. Once in a while in this ministry, once in a while I have to speak and I talk about works. I say to people, you know, if you're saved, there's some things that will change regarding works. If you rob the, a bank, you, you stop robbing banks. There's things that are obvious. But I tell you, while I mention that once in a while, there's certainly obvious things that I say. But my message is not normally that. My message is the message of preaching grace. And the grace of God is a totally free gift where God removes all condemnation for yesterday, today, and forever, because when you got saved, He forgave your sins of yesterday, today, and forever. Your sins for later today, and for tomorrow, and for ten years from now, He already forgave them. You say, what? You say, well, does this not mean if you preach this kind of thing, and I know all my sins are forgiven, then, then I guess I can do what I like. I'll go out and get drunk, and I'll go back to robbing the banks, or whatever. Listen. If you really get saved, you're going to have such desires after God that you want to go, you don't want to go out and rob the bank. But it'll take time for you to change. It takes time to, for you to change. But God's not going to suddenly say, you're mine, you're holy, you're forgiven, because, well, now that you've got one, one year of of, of getting more like me, therefore now you're holy. Not at all. You're holy and accepted by Him, by faith, instantly the moment you get saved. That's it. You're His. No condemnation. Now we dread. We are saved. Amen. We develop in the Lord after that. Go ahead and praise Him. <laughs> Charles Wesley said, No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in Him is mine. Alive in Him my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim through Christ, claim my crown through Christ, my own. Look at me, you over here, and you over here, and you over here, and you over here. You're being robbed of the joy of your salvation. You're being robbed of the excitement of salvation. You're being robbed of the sheer joy of your salvation. Why? Because the devil, assisted by religion, is bringing you into condemnation during those periods of where you have failed. And we all fail because we're human. But you've got to understand that you're not being condemned by God because He accepted you when you trusted Him and you're saved and you are covered by the precious shed blood of the Lamb, by His imputed righteousness. That's what gives you joy. And He is helping you to grow down here, but He's not sending you condemnation regarding your works. What He's doing is saying, there's nothing between you and me because you're trusting me. Amen. Don't let the devil rob your joy because you fall short. Why? Because we all fall short. We all fall short every day, every week, every year. 
and it's all right to develop in the Lord. It's all right to grow. It's all right to say, you know, I used to go out and I used to steal and I don't do it anymore. That's growth. That's developing. Thank God for that. But even when you're struggling, and by the way, should you live until you're 90, the day before you pass to be with the Lord, you're still going to be falling short. You will grow. But all along, your rejoicing ought to be, wow, do you mean I'm without condemnation and you accept me? Even though I'm making a mess of things down here because I trust you? The answer is yes to that. And by the way, the more you get that joy regarding your standing, the more power you will have relating to your state to have the victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's a powerful point. Whew. Where was I reading? Because I can't remember. Get it clearly in your mind. Have you got done there? Yes. Get it clearly in your mind. Let me see this here. Where am I? Yeah, here it is. To be holy does not mean that you're totally perfect. It means that you are totally His. Stop for a moment and think about that. To be holy. What? Totally accepted by God. Just as if what, Leslie? Just as if you were perfect. What? How did that happen? Because you're in Christ. We're accepted in the beloved. And when you're in Christ and Christ has got you on the inside, Christ is then accepted by the Father because he's Christ. And it means that you're accepted by the Father with the same acceptance that Christ is accepted by the Father because when Christ stands in front of the Father, you're inside, so you're totally accepted as well. It's phenomenal. Rejoice in your salvation. Don't let the devil keep condemning you because you fall short. You grow, you, long, you learn, you work on your subject, but there's something else going on. God accepts you as perfect. What do you say, Leslie? I'm telling you, God accepts you as perfect. I want to preach more of what the gospel is, which is the astounding grace of God, which comes because of one thing, trust, and it has nothing to do with works. Well, Esther, you're, 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 you're going to encourage people, and I'm repeating this, you're going to encourage people by telling them that about the standing and about trust. You encourage them to go out and do wrong and just say, well, after all, I'm accepted. God accepts me. I can do wrong. If you're really His and you long for Him and you're accepted in Him, His Spirit will be in you and will help you to develop and to live for Christ. Amen. Whew. The Bible says, I get it, Walk in the Spirit. What does it mean walking in the Spirit? Some people think that means, you know, you get spooky, you know. <laughs> Some meetings you see, you know, people get all kind of, I'm walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit means that you don't walk by the works of the flesh. You work by what Jesus did for you in Calvary. And then what does it say? Walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Ah, ah. So the more you enjoy that you are fully, perfectly saved before Him, perfectly saved, nothing to add to it, as saved as you will be a billion years after you're in heaven and with Him. Isn't that powerful? The way that you're saved right now, which is an eternal way to be saved, and you rejoice in that, that will help you in your life, to walk not after the lust of the flesh. But you know what the church preaches? The exact opposite. The church preaches all against the lust of the flesh. And then they say, when you don't do that, then you'll be walking in the Spirit. But that's a non sequitur. That's, that's not true. That's putting it the wrong way. Now, this, now get it, it's deep. If it says walk in the Spirit, that is, you're trusting God, 
that you're perfect in salvation. You're not perfect as a person, but what you've got is perfect and perfectly accepted by God. Having that joy will bring you power not to walk in the flesh. But if you do it the other way and only preach to people that you've got to be perfect in your flesh and think that that will make you then be perfect before the Lord, it never will. All it will make you is a Pharisee and it will make you miserable because you will never get to that place where you know you're perfect because you're not perfect. You do not try to work perfect so that you can so so suddenly be holy. Now listen to it. You do not grow in Christ and change and do things in order to become holy and wholly accepted by Him. It'll never happen that way. But because you're wholly accepted by Him, then you can start to grow in strength because that knowledge will give you strength and joy and power and the devil's chains will start to fall off in your life. But if you sacrifice on trying to change to be holy, it'll never work. But if you rejoice that you're worthy only because of what Jesus did on your holy, that knowledge and that rejoicing will give you supernatural power to help you not to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Do you see the difference there? Praise Him if you got it there. It used to be in Ireland, you know, to be holy was you were to wear your hair this way or don't wear it or wear a hat or wear makeup or don't wear makeup. It was all a bunch of rules and regulations. Wrong! One more time I'm going to say it. No matter how much you try to be perfect, it'll never make you holy. You can't do it. You're human. You'll still fail. However, the more you rejoice that you're already holy because you trust Him, that joy and that power will give you amazing ability to overcome the works of the flesh. Amen. See the difference? Amen. The church usually preaches it the other way. This is kind of in, in depth. Get it clearly in your mind. Is that where I'm at? To be holy does not mean that you're totally perfect. It means that you're totally His. You belong to Him 100%. Not performance, it's commitment. This knowledge sets us free so, uh, from so many of the bondages of Satan and tradition. Look this way. Let me point over at you. I know that you're not perfect. I know you're far from perfect. Don't try to be pharisaical and appear religious like those holy so-called preachers did in Ireland. You're not perfect. You're, 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 you're human. You're the exact same. You're the same. You're the same. And above all, I'm the same. Far from perfect. But before God, totally and 100% accepted and holy before God, not because of one work that's done, but because of my trust and your trust upon what Jesus performed on Calvary 2,000 years ago. And when you trust, God says that you are holy and completely His. Amen. So I demand that you don't try to be holy through your works that you rejoice that you're already holy, and when you do that, that power will help you in your works. Amen. Wow, 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 wow. Amen. Go ahead and praise Him. <laughs> to be holy does not mean that you're totally perfect. It means that you're totally His. You belong to Him 100%, not performance, it's commitment. This bondage sets us free from so many of the bondages of sin, of Satan, and tradition. Therefore, before I move to the next bit, I'm going to look back on this group over here. Look, look at me. You're holy. You're saved. You're righteous. Yeah, but I, I lost my temper last Thursday. Or I did so. Listen. I'm not talking about what you did. I'm talking about what you trust in what Jesus did on Calvary. When you trust Him, you're holy. And it's not because of your goodness. It's because of the marvelous grace of God 2,000 years ago. Rejoice in the holiness that's already yours through trust. Holiness is through trust, not through performance. 
you're holy. Say me holy. If you only knew me, say it's a gift. It's a gift. It's like somebody saying, well, well, I need $1,000 and somebody pays it for you. It's paid for. Well, I didn't pay it. I understand you didn't pay it, but it's paid for. Therefore, you can rejoice. It's paid for. Jesus paid for it for you, and he paid for it for you too. The grace of God says it's staggering what the grace of God does. You are holy. You are saved. You are right for heaven. You are pleasing to God. You are covered with righteousness. God is, to use a human term, you are tickled with him and thrilled with him. You're a holy person reserved unto God. Why? Because he's so thrilled that you're not trying to depend upon your own works. You are by faith depending solely on what the Savior did on Calvary through his death and his resurrection. And because of that, at this moment, you are perfect. You are healed. You are delivered from all these things. And you are holy before God. Right now you're holy. Go ahead and praise Him. I could say it a thousand times until I, I, I ram it into your head. You're holy. You're holy. It's our standing. What's our state? Well, when you get that joy that you're holy and that you're complete in your salvation and you start to do it, you know, not so... You're not living the way you ought to be living. He's going to give you such power because that power derives from the great joy that he's not condemning you because of that, because he's rejoicing in your completeness. The Bible says, now listen to it by Paul, ye are complete in him. You're 100% complete, period. Nothing else to do. You're saved because of the blood. Because of the blood. It's not because of $58. It's because of the blood of the everlasting covenant. To God be the glory. Amen. So what are you? You're holy. What are you? You are complete. I am complete in him. But, but if you don't watch, you know, the devil's condemnation will make you feel I'm far from perfect. Rebuke that thing. Repent of it. If you did something wrong, God will give you power. But I'm saying it again because it's so deep. I'm saying it again. The thing that will give you most power over weak things is when you rejoice over the fact that you're separated unto God, you're accepted as holy before Him because of your trust, and that will fill you with joy, and that will give you power over the world, the flesh, and the devil. Amen. You're holy. You're holy. You're holy. You are holy before God. Verses to ponder. Let's go quickly. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Now listen to what it says. Ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. It says, ye are not your own. You're bought with a price. Look this way. You do not say, it's no longer my car because it's not perfect. It's no longer my child because he's not mature. God doesn't say anything like that. God says you're his. Why? Because according to this, you're bought with a price and you are not your own. Galatians 1 verse 10, For do I now persuade man or God, or do I seek to please man? For if I yet please man, I should not be the servant of Christ. The word is doulos. You are a servant of God. You belong to Him. Look this way. You're covered. All your failures are covered because of the everlasting blood covenant, and you're perfect before Him. I emphasize that from now on, you start to praise Him more for being complete in Christ rather than for your failures. You rejoice in your standing rather than just your state. Friends, listen. We don't have nearly the joy of our salvation. We don't have the thrill of amazing grace. We don't have the exception and the excitement of who and what we are in Christ. Why? Because of the devil's condemnation, which ruins our joy of this free gift. It, it's something like this. 
Let me say this. Let's say you owe a big amount of money. You owe $100,000. And, 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 and somebody's going to sue you for it. I mean, you're really burdened to the ground. And somebody pays it all for you. And then just imagine this for a moment. They pay it for you. And you get news it's paid for and they've been paid off. Your creditor has been paid off. Instead of you having joy, which normally you would have, but by the illustration... You keep walking about saying, well, you know, I'm far from perfect. I lost my temper this week. I'm far from what I ought to be. And you concentrate so much on your shortcomings that you don't get the joy. You've just had the bill of $100,000 paid. And when you get that joy, that'll help you to start to live again. Jesus died on the cross. Start to rejoice in it. Why? Because he made you complete. Even Jesus Christ himself cannot add to your salvation. When he saved you, you're saved for time and eternity. And the whole connection is through trust and never through your performance. And that joy and that excitement will give you power as you're maturing and growing in Christ. Praise him if you will. Do you get, friends, the whole point that I'm saying? This is a bit heavy stuff. Are you over there get the point what I'm saying? One more time. Well, then, if that's one, then I can go out and do what I want to do. Wrong! When you get this kind of joy that you've already been made holy and you're a saint and you're complete, you'll find there's power to help you live a life of victory instead of going back to those things. Amen. Acts 27, 23. I want to go as quick as I can. But if you will allow me, I want you to get this. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. Paul said, I belong to God. Paul well, didn't say he was perfect, but the salvation is perfect. Now listen to this. I've got to read it. Exodus 21, verses 1 through 6. Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go free for nothing. So we're talking about a slave. If he come in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If he's a master, if his master have given him a wife, she was already a slave, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall have to go out by himself. But if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I shall not go out free. I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. The word is actually Elohim, God. He shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl. And he shall serve him forever like his master's voice. I'm rushing this too quick. But look this way. I'm not even going to ask you. I'm going to continue with this as quickly as I can. But get it over to you. It's a monumental message. One more time, you're in desperation. You've been under the burden for $100,000. Somebody paid it for you. You ought to be happy. Instead of that, you're saying, I am still miserable because I'm condemned of my mistakes. Don't do that. Jesus died on Calvary. Rejoice in that regardless of your mistakes. And that rejoicing will give you power regarding to your mistakes and you'll mature all the more. Here, going back to the Old Testament, now get it. A man who hasn't got enough money or whatever, he becomes a slave. He works for uh, these six years. Then he is set free. But during that period, he marries a wife. He's got children. And he says, I'm going to stay with my master. I'm not going to go free. I want to be my master's forever. You know what he does? When he makes that statement, the judges of the people, the hierarchy come in. They bring him close to the door, the door of the house. And they get then something that, like an all A-U-L, A-U-L, like a sharp instrument of iron that pierces his ear. And that represents a pierced ear close by the door. The idea is simple. It was symbolic that he was going to be right at the door, listening to what the master said, because the master lived in the door. So now he's got a voice. Do you remember in the old days, some of you younger people wouldn't remember it, uh, at least it was in Ireland. I don't know if you had it here. But there was a, an advertisement that they used to have for like an old gramophone with the horn. And it was a little dog that sat and listened to the gramophone. And it always said, his master's voice. Do any of you remember that? That's an old ad. Yes, you do. His master's voice. Listen to me. This is saying, 
I'm not perfect, I know that, but something symbolic has happened. And the ear is pierced. It's just symbolic to show that I have got an ear for the master. It's the master's voice. From now on, don't let the devil ruin you that you're always condemned by the devil talking to you about your failures. Start to listen to the master's voice. And he says, I'm the masters from this day forth forever. We are not rejoicing enough. We are not happy enough. We are not thrilled enough because of the grace of God, because of the blood, because of Calvary. Why? Because the devil and preachers condemn us so much that we're always condemned about our shortfallings and we feel, will we ever get to the place of being holy? You're already holy. You're already saved. You're already righteous. D.K. Usane, rejoice in that. And see how your rejoicing in your standing will gloriously help your state. Yeah. Oh, I want another praise the Lord for that, friends. I want another praise the Lord. We need to be almost so excited we can't stand it. Honestly, so excited we're saved. We're complete. You're what? Yeah, the hundred thousand's paid. You don't go around saying, and I'm back to my same illustration, well, I'm miserable because I failed. If somebody paid you $100,000, you would go about saying, fantastic, fantastic, it's done. I, well, you're far from perfect. Hey, I know I'm far from perfect, but listen, he paid $100,000 for me. I'm dead free. Fantastic. That's the way we ought to be in salvation. Instead of that, preachers have ruined us. A wrong message has ruined us. The devil has ruined us. Why? Because one more time, I've been over it a thousand times, it seems, we think more about our lack of success rather than thinking about God paying the $100,000, which is not $100,000. It's the blood. We're saved by grace. We're saved by the grace of God. We're saved. You say, you guys over there, uh, that you're, per you're perfect. Say, I'm perfect. Yeah, you're perfect. You're perfect. You're perfect. You're perfect. You're perfect. You're perfect. I'm perfect. We're perfect. Not in the sense of little things that we're maturing in, but you don't get a little baby, do you, who gets born, and six weeks later it, dro it grows an extra ear, and then when it's three years of, of age it gets an extra thumb. No, it has to mature, but it's perfect when it was born. When you got saved and you're trusting Him, the job's complete. You're perfect, you're holy, you're accepted with God. Start to accept that, and while you're accepting that, you'll also be growing like the child and maturing. You're going to make mistakes. You can't help it. But you will mature better when you're rejoicing more because you are complete in Him. The job's done. You're holy. Shut up to the devil who's blaming you on everything and start rejoicing in your standing rather than struggling in your state. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Blessed be God. Praise Him. What are we going to do? We belong to the Master. We have got an ear for His voice, and we'll praise Him rather than an ear for the condemnation of the devil. Amen. Summary. Let's go on. No, no, it says, uh, sorry, Psalm 40 and verse 6. Sacrifice an offering thou didst not desire. Mine eyes hast thou opened. Kara, meaning to bore or to dig. So it's a digged ear. I remember one time long ago preaching on digged ears. Burnt offering and sin offering as thou not required. Summary. I'm going to go ahead with this, friends. We should get to know the Greek word. Now we're in the New Testament. You know that the Hebrew is the Old Testament. It's Greek in the New Testament. We should get to know the Greek word agios or hagios. They drop the H in pronunciation. It's agios in the New Testament. It is translated as holy or saint, but it is a liturgical word and means commitment. You're holy because you're his and you're saved. Another Spiro Zodiades thing in point number two, he explains the word hagias mos which is a cognate word or a, or a family word, same family with hagios. He declares hagiosmos and dk osis, another cognate word with dk usine. And the whole thing means justification, which denotes not only the act of God's free grace in justifying sinners, but also the result of that justification upon the sinner and making him just and equipping him to recognize the right of God upon his life. 
I know it's too fast. Look this way again. Hagios, what is it? We are totally His. Salvation is perfect. And then because of that, that gives us such power and gives us such strength that is going to help us to grow and mature in the Lord. And friends, if you did do something and you blew it, ask for forgiveness, and then refuse to do anything else but to rejoice that while you made a mistake in your state, it's nothing to do with your standing because you're still holy before God. What is it? It's the magnificent grace of God. Salvation is greater than we could ever really grab hold of. It's phenomenal to be saved. Are you glad you're saved, friends? It's phenomenal to be saved. Wow. This is what, number three, is liberation from condemnation. Do you feel any of this? Am I just talking through my head here? Do you, do you at least feel some kind of, you're liberated. You're not condemned. You're liberated. Why? Because of a gift, because of a gift, because of a gift. It's because of a gift. It's because of a gift. Somebody paid, no, not your $100,000. Somebody paid the price on Calvary. You accept it by faith. God said, that's it. It's done. No condemnation now I dread, for there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Archie Bunker. Did you ever hear of Archie Bunker? I love Archie Bunker. Once in a while if I see a rerun, it's so crazy. It's fun to watch it. But listen to what it says and be careful. Archie Bunker there's a certain book that said something like God and Archie Bunker. This is true. There's a book somebody wrote. And this was the beginning statement. It says, in the beginning, Archie created God after his own image. Did you get that there? Did you get that? Did you everybody get it? In the beginning, Archie created God in his own image. Look this way. More than Archie Bunker does that. Most preachers do that. We create God in our own image. And whether it's self-esteem or whether it's condemnation because of our lack and our failures or whether it's, you know, uh, uh, doing all the nice things for, for, for people and, and trying to be, as I say, full of self-esteem and so forth. Don't do it that way. Do it God's way. Amen. And what is God's way? God's way is this. We are made perfect through right standing which is by trust, without the assistance of works. If you do 200 works to be better, you'll never get salvation. If you do 10,000 works to be better, it'll never get you salvation, never get you holiness. That's by faith in the finished work of Christ. So we're not going to try to twist God into the person that we want. We're going to try to serve the Scriptures as you're being taught today in this message regarding Holiness. Number four, I'm almost through. Theocentric, anthropocentric. Theocentric is a message that's God-centered. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. How do you get it? You paid for it. You, you, excuse me, you believe for it, he paid for it. Not anthropocentric, which is a message that's man-centered. You've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to do the other thing. Wrong! Galatians 5, verse 1, go quickly, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What's the yoke of bondage? Allowing the devil to torment us when we should be in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Now here's a big one. I'm about to, to finish. I know this is a bit longer than normal. Is it all right to give you this last little bit? Wave at me and help me. Help me. I need your encouragement. This is heavy stuff, but I want you to get it. Now you're going you're gonna to hear something that's so big in the Lord, you're, you're going to gasp, but I want you to get it. Every one of you. So, so i got to say it. Fasten your... Seatbelts, 1 John 3, 20 and 21. You could almost weep with joy. Let me read it first. For if our heart condemn us. Look this way. 
Here's your standing, you're trusting God, but over here you blew something. You don't want to do it. Trusting God will give you strength not to do it again, but, 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 but you blew something. And I mean, you feel so bad about it. Your conscience is going to condemn you or whatever, and the devil and preachers are going to join, join in and so destroy you that you, you lose the joy of, of the free gift. But what does it say? It says something revolutionary. So let's read it. If our heart condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. Look this way. What's that mean? If your heart, your conscience condemns you relating to your state, God is bigger than that situation. What is he? God knows that. He knows that you're going to get forgiven. But he's a lot bigger than that thing that you blew. So let's say how big he is. He is so big that Jesus died for you. He knows your love. He knows your blessing. He knows that you want his blessing. He knows a whole lot of things. He's bigger than that thing. And you ask for forgiveness for that, but above all, rejoice in your salvation, and you will soon overcome that thing and have joy to stay as an overcomer. Because even when your heart condemns you, it doesn't say God turns miserable. It says even then, when your heart condemns you, God is greater than your heart. It's a marvelous thing to know. Salvation it still works. You're still holy through trust. Amen. And then it says, when you got that fixed up, when your heart condemn us not, you have more confidence toward God because it was dealt with right away. Isn't that beautiful? So what do we have as we close? Three things. Look this way. You've got standing. You've got state. You've got growth. Look this way for a moment. One more time. What is our standing? Lord, I trust you. I give my whole being to you. God makes us holy. He gives us Christ in his wonderful full salvation, D.K. Usene. We're covered with the blood. That's our standing. Underneath our standing, like as if right now I had a big white sheet over me. You couldn't see me. You know I'm there, all right. You know the shape is there, but I'm covered. You are covered, but underneath it, there you are. That's your state. But as you work on that with maturity, you will get stronger in the Lord. And as you do what? As you, as you do that, what is that? That is growth. That's like the baby growing. You'll never be totally perfect in that sense, but you're perfect in the sense that the work is done. Because of the standing, the standing comes through trust. The state develops through learning where you blew it and getting God's strength so that you don't need to do it next time. And if you do it next time, he'll help you the next time or whatever. I'm trying to make a big issue of it because it is. We ought to be delirious almost with joy and not allow the devil to torment us with condemnation. Now, here is a statement which is powerful that we're finishing with, but you've got to hear it. What God does for you is even more important than what God does in you. Look this way. It's great what God does in you because we're developing in Him. But if He didn't do something for you to begin with, He could never do anything in you. It's what he does for you, which is a total gift. And after he does that and you accept that, then you're filled with joy, and that gives you immeasurable strength to develop in maturity regarding your state. For your standing is through trust. Your state is through development in Christ. That's growth. And then it says, Thank God for koidos Yisrael. God says... I'm holy, I'm other, you're total, look this way, you're totally dedicated to me, I want you to be holy too, that is, you're totally mine, and that will help you to grow in the Lord and in the power of his might. I hope I didn't keep you too long, I couldn't quit that today until you got it. You are free. Salvation is magnificent. Let's stand and let's rejoice in it, every one of us. Come on, let's go ahead. Come on, rejoice in it, friends.